with the faith that works in them. Because the Bible said wherever one saint is, he can chase a thousand demons. Two saints can chase 10,000. What would happen if we just had 12 people in here today? Just 12 people that can touch and agree at the same time. How much binding power would there be? How much loosening power would there be? How many demons will we really chase? How many strongholds will really be broken? What would happen to this environment? What will happen to this city, this state, this region? If I can just find ten righteous, will God spare the city? Is there ten righteous people in this house? I don't hear nobody. Man, we're going to move on, but let the Redeemer of the Lord say something. That was about five. That ain't going to be enough. He that is righteous, let them be righteous still. Ooh, you want to touch yourself say, Lord, I trust you, I trust you, I trust you. Lord, when I can't even trace you, I trust you. When I can't even see you, I trust you. Genesis chapter 19. Genesis chapter 19. Genesis chapter 19. Uh, we're looking at the voice translation. Uh, verse 16 through verse 26. And then I want you to turn your attention to Luke chapter 17, the New Testament. And we're going to look at it from the EXB translation, two verses, verse 31 and 32. Are you there? Luke chapter, no, let's go to Genesis. Genesis chapter 16, and uh, let's pick up at verse uh, 15. Are you there? Did I say 19? 19, I'm sorry. Pray for me. All right, verse 16 says, but Lot kept procrastinating. So Lot kept procrastinating, delaying, putting it off, prolonging something when it's already been assigned to do something. Look at that person again and say, stop your procrastinating. You don't have what God promised you because you ain't done what God told you to do. But Lot, he, he kept procrastinating, which means this was not the first time. This was not the first time he had been given instruction to do something. But Lot kept procrastinating. So the two heavenly messengers just grabbed him. The two angels of God just grabbed him. See, so you ain't you you gonna keep procrastinating. Let me let me help you. Grabbed him, his wife and his two daughters by the hand. They took them outside the city, a safe distance away, because the eternal decided to show mercy to Lot and his family. And as they were leading them to safety. One of the messenger gave this instruction. Watch what the angel now. God have already given instruction. He's going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay. Because he couldn't find 10 righteous still living there. And the four he's about to save, they are not righteous either. But they've been covered by the covenant of Abraham. Watch this. Are you ready? So the eternal decided to show mercy to Lot and his family. And as they were leading them to safety, one of the messenger gave this instruction. Watch what the angel said. He said, now run. Run for your lives. 
don't look back or stop anywhere in the plane. Somebody say, in the average. Below average. Mediocre. Get away from that plane life. Get away from your average life. Quit living a average, mediocre, beneath your standard of God's living for you. He said, head for the heels or you will die along with everyone else. Y'all ready? Verse 18, Lot says, my Lord, no. Now, he just saved you and your family. When you was procrastinating and didn't want to follow the instruction that was already given to you. Now you're getting another level of instruction and you still think you got something to say. He said, I realize you have showed me some great kindness and favor me by saving my life. But please, I can't run that far. <laughs> he said, I can't, I can't run that far. Now he already told him what to do. Now he's trying to change the game plan in the middle of the game. He says, great kindness, favor by saving my life, but please, I can't run that far. The devastation will surely catch up with me. And I will die anyway. Verse 20. He said, look over there is a city. It's not too far. I could escape there. It's just a little one. Please let me go there instead. Then my life will surely be saved. This is Lot. The first thing God told him after getting to Mount Sinai is don't go to the plane. The first thing he says once he gets out of the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, give me the plane. Why is God going to deliver us out of a situation we've been in just so we can go back to a normal? Why is God going to keep you from a situation just to let you go back into a situation that's still average? I, I, I wish I could have somebody. See, right now, the job you're about to leave, God is not going to open the door just to give you that same type of job. God is not getting you out of that vehicle he's taking you from just to put you in the same type vehicle. God is not going to allow you to go through what you've been through just so you can go back being who you were. I declare prophetically what God's about to do for some of you. Eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, neither have it entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for you. God have allowed you to go through much more because he's planning to do much more with you. There's some things that used to be your testimony will be a different testimony in the seasons to come. God is not still using you to give that same testimony. He delivered you from a headache. There is a different level of calling of an assignment on your life and there's a greater anointing that goes with it. I wish I had some faith walkers in here. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Are you ready? Watch watch this. Verse 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 number 21. He says, "Look as look look as a favor to you. I won't destroy the little city." You talking about? We're here right now. Escape there because I can't do anything until you arrive there safely. God is saying you are holding back some things God want to do on the other side because you ain't got to where God has positioned you to be right now. That's some things. They have not changed in your bloodline because you ain't changed to give it the DNA that it needs for that spiritual transfusion. Uh, I, God is 
is waiting on you to get in the position and the place he have ordained, not just for you only, but what he has to deal with that's behind you. Because while God is saving your life, he's destroying the stuff that used to be a part of. I need somebody to shout to the glory of God. Watch, watch this. Are you, are you ready now? He says, because of this, this little city, Lot escaped to what's called Zor, which means little. Okay? God wants to do something big for you. But you asking God to give you something little. Here we go. Lot and his family arrived in Zor just as the sun was coming up. Then the eternal one rained sulfur. They call it brimstone. Sulfur and fire from out of heaven unto Sodom and Gomorrah. He destroyed both city along with the other villages and town in the valley. And all of the people who lived there. Even the vegetations was wiped out. But Lot, watch this, but Lot's wife never made it. She lagged behind her husband and looked back. Despite the messenger's advice and turned into a pillar of salt. Now I want to read the narrative of this voice translation. The narrative says, Lot's wife makes a fatal turn. She stops and looks back. No one knows why. Perhaps it is to mourn the past. Perhaps curiosity gets the better of her. But instead of looking ahead to her destination, a place of safety and security, she turns around and looks back at what she had left behind. In that instant, as the messenger warned, she perishes. All that is left of her is a standing pillar of salt. Go to Luke 17, verse 31, 32 EXB. I know it's a lot of reading, but please be patient with us. Verse 31, 32, the EXB translation, Luke 17, verse 31 and 32. It says, on that day, a person who was on the roof, roofs were typically flat and used as an extra room and whose belonging are in the house should not go inside. Come down, get them. A person who was in the field should not go back home turn back. Verse 32, this is the word of Jesus, remember Lot's wife, who was judged for the lonely, looking back at Sodom. Watch this. Who was judged for looking back at Sodom. Are you ready? Those who try to keep, preserve, and keep and secure their life will lose them. But those who give up, lose, or let go of it their life will save them. From verse 33, from Genesis 19 to Luke 17, this verse 33, it says this in the parenthesis clause. It says, for those who give up or lose it, let go of it. I want to I talk about let it go. I want to talk about let it go. Write, write that down. You may be seated. I want to talk about let it go. Let it go. Because when, when you look at Lot's wife, It it was not the tragedy that she just looked back. The indication that she looked back is is telling us she couldn't let it go. And that's some things that God has prepared for us in this season. We will not fulfill the destination of this destiny journey until we let some stuff go. There's two things I want to talk about in letting go. I want to talk about the things that we got to let go and some people we got to let go. And then I want to talk about there's some things that God's going to create in our life in this season to come. That's got to let go of us. Okay. Because some things that we are seasoned to do ourselves, but then there's some things that God supernaturally intervened. To stop the hand of the enemy to cause it to let it go. The first thing you 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 understand when God now speaks to Moses 
He turns around and speaks to Moses and he tells Moses to go to Pharaoh. Why is he going to Pharaoh? He said, go tell Pharaoh to let my people go. He got to let it go because they have served their time in bondage. Now it is time for them to get their departure. Now the Bible said on several attempts that when Moses goes to Pharaoh and he said, God said, let my people go. But God had already told Moses that it's going to be time and opportunity. He's going to keep hardening Pharaoh's heart before Pharaoh let them go. There's some things now that God has prophetically spoken in many of your lives. And every time it looked like you're about to come out, the enemy snatches you back. And then you begin to question God and question yourself. Did I really hear God? The answer to that is you did hear God. But the enemy's heart keeps being hard because he don't want to let you go. But I prophesy to many of you, God is about to supernaturally intervene. And every time and every day and every hour and every second of the day that you stay in that situation, God is going to be working on your behalf because all things work together for the good of him that loves the Lord according to his purpose. Touch somebody and say, God got purpose for you. And the purpose God has for you, eyes haven't seen. But God is doing a thing in the invisible realm while you're still struggling in the visible realm trying to see it. But I declare unto you, heaven and earth is now touching in an agreement. And hell is nervous now. Strongholds are nervous now. Principalities is nervous now. Because God's about to do a shake-up. He keeps going to Pharaoh. Why? Do God want his people free? He said, I want them free so they can come and worship me. Go read it. He said, so my people can come worship. I said, well, God, why they can't worship just what they had? It is hard for people to be free while they still in bondage. It is hard to get a praise on while you're still in debt. It's hard to get a praise on when death is all around you. It is hard to get a praise on when sickness is trying to keep you down. It is hard to worship him when you can't see it coming and going. But I declare unto you, if God be for you, who can be against you? So, so watch this. He goes and each time Pharaoh says, I'm going to let him go. It's because God sends a curse or a plague on Egypt. He calls the foundation and the security and the financial status of Egypt to start falling. He called what was known as the superpower to begin to come powerless. No longer powerful. I don't care what force. I don't care what powers. I don't care what influence of authority. That the enemy have assigned to your life. I declare unto you. The God that we serve. He's more than capable. He's more than able. He's more than powerful. He's more than strong. He's more than mighty. He's God all by himself. He is the keeper of the earth and the universe. And he watches over what's here. And at any given moment, he could just speak a word. As the centurion tells of Jesus, come to my house and lay your hand on my servant. He's sick and about to die. Then he remembered how power and influence works. He said, no, Jesus, don't come to my house. You God, you can just speak a word. Right where you are. And while my servant is thousands of miles away. If you just speak a word, my servant will be here. I declare unto you, God is speaking a word to some of you. And if your faith can come in agreement with the word of God, there is power 
in the name of Jesus. There's healing and deliverance in the name of Jesus. Demons tremble. That's that name. The devil's cast out. That's the name of Jesus. Dead folks get up out the grave. That's the name of Jesus. Hell get nerves. Couldn't keep Jesus three days. They said three days, but Jesus hung out for three days. Because as soon as he went to hell, he started having the revival. I don't care what you're going through. You better learn how to praise him in spite of. You better not let your trouble get you down. Because I declare unto you, trouble don't last always. Trouble is just an invitation that have invited us into a situation just so God can get the glory. Look at somebody and tell him God's going to get the glory out of this. I don't know how he's going to do it, but he's going to do it. Just when you think Lazarus is dead now because it's been there more than three days. Four days and now Rigor Marcus has set up in his body. The blood has been drained out. But there's something about the blood of Jesus that he shows up at a dead man cave and he said, Death, you got to let him go. Lazarus, get up and come out. Somebody shall let it go. I don't hear you. I don't hear you. You want to touch yourself and prophesy and say, Everything that the enemy have assigned against my life. Loose me and let me go. I declare healing in the name of Jesus. I declare victory in the name of Jesus. I declare a greater call of an anointing on your life in the name of Jesus. Somebody got to go through so you can get out. Thank God that he put you and told you to go through. Because if God had to told you, some folks would never get saved. Some folks would never get delivered. Some folks would never get healed. God used your life as a testimony. So you can have a chance to testify. Greater than he is for me. That he be against you. Somebody ought to touch yourself at that name. Something about the name of Jesus. It's still the sweetest name I know. Who can stand before me? when we call on that great name? Jesus. Jesus. Blessed Savior. We have the victory. And I'm not waiting till the walls come down. I'm going to praise him while the walls are still up. I'm not going to wait till he heal me. I'm going to praise him while I'm still down. Ooh. I'm not going to wait till I come out of this. I'm going to praise him while I'm in it. Cause can't nobody do me like Jesus. Can't nobody do me like the Lord. Can't nobody, nobody, nobody do me like Jesus. He's my, he's my friend. He's my healer. He's my deliverer. He's my way in. He's my way out. He's my way over. Oh, he's been good to me. I said he's been good to me. Don't tell me what it came to. Because every time you tell me what it came to, I'm going to remind you he already done it. The Bible says, Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun. I'm here to tell you right now. Put a name on it. Whatever you going through. And whatever name you put on it. Make sure you put Jesus with it. Somebody shall let it go. Let doubt go. You gotta let frustration.
can go. Let your unbelief go and begin to declare and prophesy to the atmosphere and begin to thank God before it happens in the manifestation. Thank God that he already gave you an invitation to meet him up in the heavens and whatever you bind in heaven he'll bind in earth and whatever you lose in heaven he'll lose it in the earth but you got to let it go that some things he can't bind until you lose it that some things God promised you that's been tied up the Bible says in Matthew he speaks to the disciples and they say go find that coat that's been tied up and if anybody asks you what are you doing with this he said you tell them the master has need of him something's got you tied up but it's gotta let you go because the devil know he couldn't tame you he couldn't control you he couldn't dictate to you he couldn't bully you so he know he had to tie you up he been riding everybody else bullying everybody else so he said the best thing I could do with them is tie them up but this is your season the master has need of you and he said loose that coat and let him go I wish I had somebody for 30 seconds give God a true sacrificial praise Ooh, you ought to prophesy not to the people around you prophesy to the atmosphere and say loose me loose me devil and let me go loose my joy loose my business loose my home loose my ministry loose my healing Oh, I feel the presence of God in this place. I mean, I need you to shout like you can see the invisible turning into never visible. Do it, God, do it. Oh, you can't stop because somebody else stopped. See, your problem is you like lot. You think it's too long. <laughs> you think it's too far. Woo. The human said, the farther I go, the better I feel. A move of Zion here. <laughs> God is destroying some stuff behind. <laughs> Philippians 3, 13 and 14 said, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. I'm forgetting those things which are behind me and I'm pressing forward ahead to the goal to the mark for the prize of the higher call in God which is in Christ Jesus somebody ought to shot right said no 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 I hadn't apprehended I haven't obtained it yet I ain't got it yet I ain't arrived yet oh I ain't above nobody yet but I'm forgetting the things that are behind me. Why am I forgetting? I let it go, let it go, let it go, let it go, let it go. I don't hear nobody. Let me let, let me close by saying this. 
Give me 10 more minutes, Dick. Let me close by saying this. Why is it so important to Lot's wife that she has to look back? Why can't she follow the instruction and realize even though I let it go physically, spiritually, mentally, it still got me. I'm wrestling with something that I can walk away physically physically from, but mentally and spiritually, it won't let me go. So the reality is, any one of us in here can be Lot's wife. Let, let me see who I'm talking to. So they're leaving because the prayers of the righteous through Abraham have begun to send forth intercessions or intercessory praying because God has now just told Abraham the greatest news of his life by this time next season, you're going to have a son. And I'm going to take these seeds of yours that will become your descendant that you're never going to stop having seeds. The Bible says in the New Testament, even Jesus said, do you not understand that you are Abraham's seed? That his covenant with my father is still multiplying? Because God will allow him to become a hundred years old before he birthed the promise. Now let me ask you this question. Is the reason you won't let go of what it is that we struggle with is because God made us promise and we ain't saw some of them yet. But when he tells him you're going to have a seed this time next season, he walks away, God walks away, and while he's walking away, he, he speaks to the deity out of the Trinity. He said, I, I, I can't leave Abraham without telling him what I'm going to do next. I can't hide nothing from my servant. See, the closer the intimacy of the relationship you have with God is the more things he'll trust you and share with you before they happen. The reason God reveals dreams the reason he reveals visions the reason he releases wisdom and knowledge through the prophetic anointing is because he give it to people that he want to pray for the outcome before it becomes income Remind somebody without touching them and say, you do know prayer changes things. Stop crying and whining about what it is that you see. And pray and call those things which are not as they supposed to be. Somebody ought to prophesy right there and say, I declare God's about to turn it around. Oh, y'all know. I, I wish I had a help in here. Matter of fact, touch yourself and say, he's turning around for me right now. Now I can pray for you good, good. 
Now I can use faith for you good good. Oh, when he work it out of me, he's going to work it out of you. When he's blessing me, he's going to be blessing you. As I go up, you go up. Watch this. Watch this. Turn around and look at that door. Look at that door. Now, now, Brother Terry, open the door. I'll show you something. Now, he opened that door. Is that door that just opened was only for one person to go through? Who can go in and out that door? So when God opens up a door for a people, he opens up for everybody that's in the door, in the house, in the cup. I'm declaring he's opening the door. And it ain't just for me, it's everyone. Okay, Brother Terry, you can close. Who got that? And the only way you don't go through the door of opportunity, you refuse to. Because all you like doing is looking back. Now I'm going to close on this. My time is almost out. Hear me good here. They leave Sodom and Gomorrah. Two cities. Sodom and Gomorrah is not one city. It's two cities. Two cities. God destroys two cities because he couldn't find ten righteous people in two cities. And Sodom and Gomorrah was a big city. Two cities. And Abraham is the only one praying for Sodom and Gomorrah and he don't even live there. He don't live in Sodom. But rather him getting so excited that God's about to bless him. The heart of an intercessor. A gatekeeper. A watchman. A true vessel of God. Don't get caught up in their own little activities of agenda and don't see what's happening in the cities. God turns around, come to Abraham and say, Abraham, I'm getting ready to destroy Simon Gomorrah. Why are you telling me? That's what he should have been saying. I don't live there. The first thing Abraham does is start praying. He starts becoming an advocate with God standing in the gap for Sodom and Gomorrah. He said, well, if you find a hundred righteous, will you spare the city? God said, I'll do it. I'll do it. But then he turns around and Abraham remembered. There's, there's many thousand there, but ain't a hundred righteous. He says, so if you find 75 righteous, will you still spare the city? God said, I will. I will. Now this is the God that just came and said I'm going to destroy. I was simple communication to God. Cause God to say, okay, I, I won't do it. Then he turns around and says, if you find 50, righteous will you spare? I'll do it for you. There's, then he said, there ain't 50 righteous in two cities. He said, what about 25, Lord? He said, I'll do it. Out of two cities, says there is not 25 righteous. Then he turned around and say, if you find 10, will you spare it? That's how I'll do it. Turned around out of 
two cities and ten righteous people. And the Bible said when he got the ten, God just turned around and walked away. Why? He showed Abraham his heart. Why would I allow two cities to become more evil and wicked? That all they'll do is multiply more wickedness. But while God was showing Abraham his heart, God knew Abraham's heart. And he said, there, there is not one righteous in them two cities. So you said, well, Lot and his wife knew? They weren't righteous. They were not righteous. Abraham was righteous. His covering and his covenant kept Lot and his household alive. Make sure the people that you want to kill that you want to keep talking and slandering again. You better hope they stay alive. Because if they ever die, who going to pray for your house? Who going to pray for your city? Some business will be set down. If there's nobody righteous that can intercede for the business. Crime will go up. If there's nobody righteous that can pray for the city. There will be more killing. There will be more devastation. When you remove the righteous from the city. I wish I had somebody shout. I got it, I got it, I got it, I got it. You got to help people in your life to have a relationship, a real relationship with God, that they can have a little talk with Jesus. And say, God, would you watch over that house? Would you watch over those families? Watch over that community. Watch over their son. Watch over their daughters. Watch over their mind and God. God don't let them fall to satanic influence. God deliver them from satanic attack. So you got to have people that you connected to that can talk to God and ain't sitting there still giving nursery rhymes. You got to help somebody that can stand in the gap and say, God, if you find any righteousness, even in me, when you look over them, let their family, let their husband stay alive. Let their wife. Give me. There was not one righteous in two cities. Sodom and Gomorrah was a metropolitan city. You talking about like New Jersey, New York. Can you imagine that you couldn't find ten righteous in New York? <laughs> Because that was Sodom and Gomorrah. So the Bible says, so the Bible says, he sends two angels to get Lot and his family out. I'm almost finished. When he goes there, Lot has two daughters and they're two virgins, but they have two husbands because the relationship have been forced. Quit forcing people to stay in relationship they don't want to be in. I don't, I don't hear nobody. The 
angel scouted the whole city but went to Lot's house and when they went to Lot's house evil started knocking on the door the angels of God blinded the men outside and said to Lot we got to go he began to take his daughter and Lot's wife and Lot and Lot sitting there pleading now you ain't praying the whole time now you think you got a voice that you can be praying and interceding but all you praying for is not the city you're praying for your house God can trust you not even to your own house because you ain't gonna pray for nobody but yours y'all ain't gonna like me so the angel said we gotta go we gotta go time running out we got to go heaven is holding back releasing fire and brimstone because Lot's still procrastinating. So now the angel, the two angels, has to snatch him out. And the instruction was, as soon as they got to the city, do not look back. Go to that other large city over there. And don't stop running until you get there. Bible says Lot still negotiating. You see how we procrastinate? God, God is trying to deliver us. And we try to tell God how to deliver us. God, God trying to bless us. But we try to tell God how to bless us. God trying to work it out. But we telling God how to work it out. We, we don't have enough reverence to sit there and let God finish talking. God is talking and we say, but God, let me say something. Who are we to disrespect a holy, righteous God that we got something to say more than God? He grabs him they run. Then he stopped and said, we, we can't run that far. Listen, if death is chasing you, man, I don't care if I'm on one leg. <laughs> I crawled in the dirt. <laughs> If God is saying that's what he wants you, he will provide an escape at the day of your temptation. Y'all don't hear me. I'm giving the word of God. Now closing. Closing. He said, well, let me go to this little city. Now where he's asking to be there is no civilization. There is no life there. So where he's asking go is take me where ain't nobody at. The angel said, you know what? Have it your way. Because God's spirit when I strive, wrestle with man always. He said, go on, have it your way. So now he's running. Watch this. But the Bible says his wife, Lot's wife, is laggering. She's lingering. Which means while her two daughters and Lot is going forward, she in reverse. She's getting now, 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 now help me to understand this, Deke, if you will. Turn this off. I'm finished. Help me, help me to understand this. I, I need to understand this. 
What's behind you? No, no matter what luxury, what big house, fancy cars, money, opportunity you had, it's being destroyed. It's on fire. It, it, it's, it's, it's being destroyed behind you. So what are you going to go back and get? Whatever you think you're going to go back and get, let me help you. It ain't there no more. It ain't there. The only thing that's still there is your heart is still in it. And your mind hadn't been made up simply because of your fear. You know why she looks back? Her fear. What fear? Her fear of letting go of her past is greater than her faith in grabbing what's ahead of her. Her fear caused her to now look back. What fear has control over you right now? That you're afraid that you can't do no more. You can't have no more. You'll never be no more. Everything you were was behind you. So she looks through fear and say, my best days, my best life is behind me. So now where am I going? I can't start over. I'm too old to do this again. I had to go through much to get what I got back to. Who am I helping? I can't, I can't go through all this again. It took me too long to get here. That's all I got. I worked hard for that. I had to give up a lot to get that. I got too many friends still back there. I still got some loved ones back there. I can't leave them. And while she's talking to herself, fear says, take one more look. And as soon as she looked, she became a pillar of salt. Tyler, this has messed me up right here. I'm promise you they're gonna finish. This was here. This messed me up. What messed me up is why didn't she become ashes? I mean, why didn't she become dirt, dust? Why why didn't God just blow her up? Why did she have to become salt? To the Bible said, even to this day. In Zor, near Jordan, where the Dead Sea is, she's still there. And it's called the Dead Sea, which is the Salt Sea. A thing about a Salt Sea is a big sea, beautiful, but full of salt. That sharks and whales and mammals can't live in it. The only thing can live in sea salt water is a small shrimp called green. The smallest thing can survive. But it'll kill a shark. But Lord, this salt. This salt. She becomes a pillar of salt because she becomes the lesson to all of us. Matthew 5 13 You are the salt of the earth but if the salt loses saltiness its flavor its savior it is good for nothing. The message was almost called Tyler 
when your season become good for nothing. You worth nothing. Because now you're no longer your worth insult. When she becomes the pillar of salt, she's a lesson to all of us. What did Jesus mean? You're the salt of the earth. Which means you had a chance. And it was your season. Because you was full of salt. Until you decide to look back, you became salt. And you just now good for nothing but to be trodden, stepped on, on the foot of man. I said, God, what are you saying? He said, tell my people, if they don't stop looking back, they're going to become that same pillar of salt. Because you got that much salt in you. That just a pinch of salt has multi abilities. A pinch of salt has multi purpose. A pinch of salt has multi season. A pinch of salt on a steak changed the identity of the steak. A pinch of salt on an infection wound become antiseptic. When you know you're worth in salt, you don't look back for nothing. Clap your hands and give God praise. Oh, come on, you can do better than that. Stand to your feet. We're closing. I, I want to say this, and, and before I pray, um, I have to say this because it's important to understand. Because Miss Lot looked back; she has two daughters, and then that's Lot. When she looked back, she just didn't destroy herself. She destroyed the future of her two daughters. And her husband. Because Lot making the wrong choice where he wanted to go. Because if he'd have went to the city in the place where God told him to go, he'd have been around new relationships. But because he decided to go somewhere where ain't nobody at, his two daughters now get some drunk and take time each night and create incest. And have babies by their father. There are two kids, two sons. One named Amon. The other one named is Moab. They become the most wickedest out of all the descendants of Abraham's lineage. Because Amon brings up a nation called the Ammonites. Moab brings up a nation called the Motorbites. Because what their mother did in looking back, she created a generation of incestuous through that bloodline. Perversion. Just because she valued more what was behind her than what was still with her. Take a think, take a thought, take a moment here. Quit crying over what won't to let you go. Because if they want to let you go, let them go. Let them go. Quit dealing with people that's leaves on your tree. And all they are leaves on your tree. Every time it becomes a difficult season, they like leaves and they leave you and fall off. 
and they don't know as soon as they hit the ground, their life was in you. And you, life was in them. And when they became disconnected, they had the little green relief dried up, withered away. And then when a new season came back again, somewhere they want to find their self back on your tree. Has left him. In this season, you got to be like Naomi. If Oprah wants to leave you, let Oprah go. Because you will not be able to get rid of Ruth. <laughs> Ruth will not leave you. Because Ruth knows where you go, they go. Your God, their God. And Ruth now, which is not a true daughter of Naomi, but she becomes now a spiritual mother. Naomi becomes like a spiritual mother. And because of that, she finds her Boaz. Because Naomi teaches her how to reap. Because she sold her life into Naomi. Now when she get back to Bethlehem, she's going to be in a reaping season. Not weeping, reaping. Gathering up the abundant. God help us right there. Lift those hands in this place. Who got that? Lift those hands in this place. All in this place. David got to let go of Absalom. Got to let him go. Jesus got to let go of Judas. Let him go. Abraham had to let go a lot. He said, go find a place wherever you want to go. See, you're keeping people in your life. While they still there, their plans was to leave you when they get out there. <laughs> yes. Why do Lot lose everything? Because everything he had, it came through Abraham. When you break your connection, you may think you get them some stuff now, but I declare it don't belong to you. It came through somebody else's faith, and you still and you still got residue still on you yet. But God gonna pay your visit and blow it off, cause that favor don't belong to you either. It came from somebody else. I need somebody to shout up at this place. No, I need somebody to shout. I ain't bragging on me. I'm bragging on God. I know my Redeemer lives. I mean, I, I want you just to let out a shout. I want you to shout. I got it. I got it. I got it. I got it. Hands lifted. See that favor? That that Bari axe head? It was borrowed. You were just the handle. But because you're so loose, you're gonna lose that connection. Because you think you're cutting down trees. You just handle. That's the only thing belong to you. It's the axe that's borrowed that you didn't pay for. Somebody else had to suffer to get that. Somebody else had to go through to get that. One more shout, I got to go. Hands lifted, hands lifted, hands lifted. All in this place. Father, we thank you. We thank you for creative opportunity. And that's our prayer right now, Lord. Create us an opportunity. 
that surpass the opportunity already in front of us. Create us another escape. And with creative opportunity, Lord, we understand it becomes creative new provision. Create a purpose. So we call on you. Because we choose to let it go. We choose to surrender. We choose to give ourselves away. Unto you we owe. Our sin have left this stain. But we thank you, Lord, for your blood that still gives us strength, that still washes us and purifies. Purify us. Sanctify us afresh. Renew us in your blood. Saturate us in your blood. Cleanse our mind. That we may think like you. So we can take on the mind which is in you. Create us a new heart. So our heart may be pure. Like your heart. Anoint us afresh. Until the oil that you anoint us with, that it runs over, spill over. That we won't be selfish, that we will touch and agree with others. That they too may experience a corporate anointing. Restore, Lord, back the joy of our salvation. Holy Spirit, here we are. Take this body, take our bodies, and make it your temple again. Find joy in your temple. Find laughter in your temple. Find your temple purified. Help us to starve and become hungry again. For your name's sake. For righteous sake. Keep us hungry, God. Hungry for you. We become so hungry that God, we sniff out lost souls. We, we become so hungry we start seeking and saving those that are lost even in our bad days that we wake up thinking about Lord who can I go minister to today Lord who, who can I seek today out God to lead them to you God God show me what house I need to go to show me what community I need to Lord speak to my mind speak your spirit into my spirit that Lord that you assigned me just like you did with Peter with Cornelius and all of a sudden he say rise up Peter and now Cornelius is coming to your house and when he come he'll lead him to Jesus Lord speak to us show us the people that we need to find that's lost that don't know you in the free part of this scene. Give us your love, Lord. The love of you to help us not to judge people, not to condemn people, but to minister to people. The love of you, Lord. Give us the love of you, God. That we bleed forgiveness. That we won't hold to anger, malice, strife. We have a forgiving spirit and a forgiving heart. So we can let all that go, Lord. That stress won't have no part in our body. Anxiety won't have no part in our life. Darkness and the voice of the enemy won't have an avenue to speak in our hearts and speak into our minds. Give us the heart of forgiveness. For Lord, those that are not saved, even now, those that are hearing, those that are viewing, and those that will hear this message later in time, 
receive them for yourself that they may accept you Lord as their personal savior that the words that have touched them in some type of conviction or something that have softened their heart that they would declare unto you I believe God sent his son Jesus I believe his son Jesus came and he walked on earth I believe that his son Jesus suffered, bled, and died at Calvary on the cross. I believe after his crucifixion that three days dead from earth, that the third day he got up. I believe this and that same Jesus today I receive him in my life. And I accept him and receive his salvation. And today I'm saved. For those that have gotten saved that are viewing this message in any capacity, I want you to now write us back or come in us and let us know that you're the one that God saved today. I believe God is saving and I believe he already has saved. And I don't have to wait to see it to believe it. My faith tell me it all is already done. Let's thank God for those that have accepted Jesus as their personal savior. No, y'all, no, we're talking about salvation. You, you, you praise my heart on a car and a house and a job and buddy. We got to get back to the place, the people of God. We got to learn how to celebrate and get excited when people have been saved and they've been healed and they've been delivered. We got to quit getting excited over temporary stuff. And we need to put Christ first and understand people are dying. People are in trouble. People are suffering. People don't know what to do. They need Jesus. And the only Jesus they'll know is the Jesus in you, the Christ in you that should not be ashamed. So that's why you don't hang out in the world and act crazy, talking crazy, talk to people and act like you're ashamed of your Jesus and you only want to talk about it when you come to church. You got to learn how to lead people to Jesus on your job, in your school, and quit being embarrassed because folks looking at you like you're crazy and that you what you talking about Jesus. I want you to know about Jesus. So listen here, I'm going to talk about him because I was a sinner and I was a wretched sinner. I was a drunk alcoholic, a drug addict. I was jacked up, messed up. And you want to know the truth? I'm still jacked up. But the reality is, I got a living sin. People need to know your Christ, and you need to quit being the same of them. And too many of you in relationships, people are ashamed of you, and they only want to get with you. When the people that they hang around Sididi is around or not around. And you still feeling like you got a friend. You got a relationship. What is a relationship and people are shaming you? I'm gone. Jesus said, if you be ashamed of me on, on earth, I will be ashamed of you in heaven. I'm, I'm walking out. I need some people that you still have a relationship and the crisis in you that you're not ashamed. And I'm not talking about when we just come to church now. I'm talking about you're not ashamed when you're on your job. You're not ashamed when you go to school. You're not ashamed when you're in a crowd. You're not ashamed when you go to your family reunions or wherever you go, and they talking about, "Oh, uh, uh, you, you in church? You talk, you, you with that God stuff? Yeah. I'm with that God stuff. Let me help you. Yeah. I'm not only with that God stuff, yeah. Yeah. but God is with me. Yeah. He lives in me. Yeah. He breathes in me. Yeah. He speaks to me, yeah. and I love Him. I love Him. I love Him. Yeah. I said, I love him, I love him, I love him. And I'm not ashamed of the gospel from Jesus Christ. For unto me, he give me sin. For unto me, he keep picking me up. For unto me, he's a God that keeps me when I'm lonely. He squints in me when I'm only. Ain't nobody, nobody. 
Kendo.